You are listening to The Real Faith Stories Podcast. Interviews with people who chose to boldly follow their faith. I'm your host, Brian Robinson. Now, let's meet our guest and hear their story. Cordell, welcome to Real Faith Stories. It is really great to have you on the program today. It's awesome to be on, Brian. Excited to get to visit with you. Well, we're going to touch on a subject that a lot of people seem to have interest in. For some, it's kind of a hot stove topic. And for others, it's kind of in the realm of the charismaniac. But we're not going to go into either of those places. I think there's some really powerful information here that we're going to share about the gift of prophecy. And we're going to chat about your backstory and how you came to faith and what you're doing work-wise and how you kind of got drawn into this whole thing and you can give some definitions for the prophetic and create a framework here to have this discussion and how this has been used to really touch other people through your gift. Sound good? Yeah, absolutely. Excited. Before we even get into your backstory, Cordell, how would you define the gift of prophecy? Oh, the, the, the fun one. I, I think, <laughs> you know, I think when we look at a specifically prophecy, it's divine inspiration, and it's just man reporting what he's hearing the Lord say. And so it's something that we we simply listen to the Lord and we ask for him to share through us, and then by faith we step out and share those things. Okay. So tell us a bit about your backstory. Sure. Yeah. So I grew up in the state of Wyoming and was grown up in the church. The church that I belong to was, I would say they aren't opposed to the gifts, but they don't talk about the gifts. So I grew up in what I like to kind of, you know, tongue in cheek call Father, Son, and Holy Bible. The Holy Spirit was something we, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit prayed, but not experienced. When I, I went to college as a music major and went to the local junior college in Wyoming, had a scholarship there, and was more culturally Christian because my parents were and hadn't really had discovered my own faith at all at that point and started just really, you know, going off into I would call rebellion. And in that process, I was at that junior college that's only a two-year program. And so to be a music major at a different university, you have to apply an audition to get into the studio. So I wanted to go to the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley, and they had a great jazz program there. I played trombone and did jazz and wanted to go there and practiced all the etudes and music and for hours and hours a day. I mean, I could just about play with my eyes closed, get down in the audition and all of the staff lines on the music just disappeared. And my brain just got real fuzzy. And I'm not typically a person who tends to get nervous in performance stuff, playing with trombone and being in front of like sometimes energizes me. And I just fell apart. I absolutely crumbled. And the, the professor actually said, he goes, no, are you taking lessons? And I said, yes. And he goes, are you, are you passing? And I was like, yeah, oh my gosh, yes, I'm passing. I have, you know, great GPA. And so he said, I can't take you even as a, as a freshman, let alone a junior. So I said, well, let me retry. It's had a bad day. So I go home, go into some depression, come back and re-audition. Same thing happens. Wow. So very disheartening, really into depression, just all the things of the world. I was like, well, I'll just, all right, fine. If God's not give me what I want. <laughs> I'm going to go do whatever I want. And got into that summer. I wasn't sure where I was going to go to school. I thought about going, but at this to like University of of Colorado in Boulder or Colorado State Universities because they were close to Wyoming. I didn't really know where to go. And so in the summer, I get this chance call from my guitar teacher and he says, hey, they're doing a jazz camp in in Boulder, Colorado at the University of Colorado. They need some college players to fill it out. So I go while I'm there. I end up meeting the trombone professor from University of Central Oklahoma in Edmond. I meet him and said, hey, can I come study with you? And he was like, great. Yep, I'm at the University of Central Oklahoma. You know, here's my number. Well, this is three weeks before school starts in in summer. And I came home and told my parents, hey, I know I'm not walking with the Lord. I know that God is telling me to go here. And my parents were like, okay, well, where is it in Oklahoma? And I said, I don't know. It's got to be in the middle, like Central Oklahoma. I had no idea. Like, didn't know where Edmond was. None of that. I had served in the Army National Guard and done military training at Fort Sill. So I knew that experience of Oklahoma, which was in like the late 90s, and it was 100 degrees for a month straight that I was there. So not super excited, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I thought this is where I'm supposed to go. So we drive down from Wyoming. As we're pulling in on I-35 near Edmond, Oklahoma, there's a giant white cross. It's, I don't say like 60, 80 feet tall. 
And my parents saw that and thought that was a pretty significant sign. So I get to school, get enrolled. About two, three weeks in, my world just unravels. Just realize I'm a thousand miles from home. Like my lifestyle's catching up to me in terms of like, I just can't keep up with school and things. And my mom had packed my Bible and I was living on campus in an apartment. And I remember opening my Bible up to Romans 8. I read it. And on the floor of my apartment at University of Central Oklahoma, I gave my life to Jesus, August 28th of 2000. Hmm. And that it was interesting because I'm a, I'd say I'm a pretty heavy extrovert. I love being around people, but I really just drew into the, to the word and it makes me think, you know, that verse that God's word does not return void. All the scripture I'd been poured into as a kid was just coming back to me. Only this time, it was like alive. And I, I understood it differently. So I would go to my classes, do all my stuff, and then I would come back and I would spend time praying, listening to worship music. And, and really, the Lord was just taking me through, like <laughs> undoing all the worldly practices I've been in and just kind of re, I'm definitely rewiring who I was. I really know, I really feel that like I was made new. I was made alive with Christ. And so I'm a pretty intense person generally. <laughs> so, you know, I'm very, very direct. And so I was able at that point, um, pretty neat at University of Central Oklahoma is very diverse. So I had a lot of roommates. My first roommates were from Korea, Japan, and Jordan. And so then as I went through roommates, ended up leading a bunch of my roommates to the Lord and so that was really fun and getting involved in ministry stuff. Kind of in that whole time, I, I generally would say I could read people pretty well, but suddenly I started being able to read people really well. Like I just knew things about them that I probably shouldn't know. And so I was involved with the church that kind of the same denomination I'd grown up, grown up in, out in here in Oklahoma. And I was going to that church and in the college ministry, and it was really vibrant. There were a lot of people uh, right around that 2000 time in Oklahoma that were, were being saved. Like it was like a, I don't want to say a mini renewal revival. I don't know, but and there were a lot of us that were new believers and it was really great. Well, remember we took a spiritual gifts test because you know, that's what you do at church <laughs> right? In that, in that time. And mine came out with like prophecy as one of mine. And one of the, the college girls, it was a friend of mine next to me looks over and goes, you must've done it wrong. Cause that's not right. <laughs> I didn't have any context for that really. Now my parents had been believers since I was little and they were became spirit filled about the time I entered college. So when I was going to that junior college in Wyoming, and I thought they had lost their minds. Like I thought they were kooky. Well, I was just like, oh, I love you. You guys are weird. And especially because I wasn't walking with the Lord. What was it that you saw in your parents that made you think they're kooky after that happened? They would talk about the Holy Spirit like it was a real thing. They would pray and listen like very intently. They were very sensitive to like what music I would listen to. And when in the past that had not really been an issue. I mean, they were good parents and kind of shepherded us. You know, we didn't have like unfettered access to HBO or anything, but you know, but in general, like their faith became a lot more serious. They spent a lot more time doing it. They were with people that like, I remember my dad had the Holy Spirit to give my dad really some connections to the United Kingdom and in Wales. And one of the guys that he met there, Jack Jones, had come over to stay with my parents one of the summers. And I remember him just poking at me and asking me questions. And all of it, as I look back, was super gentle. It was totally the Lord. And I just was like, you're crazy. (laughs) (laughs) What is going on? Because it just, it was so contrary to what I knew. I looked at my faith as like almost a cultural thing. Like, we, well, you go to church and you you go every Sunday or you go to Sunday school and that's great. And you say hi to people and it's a nice social thing. And And then you go back to doing whatever you do normally. It's just like belonging to a gym. Mm -hmm. But my parents suddenly, although we're committed churchgoers, suddenly it became more than just Sundays. It was constant. You started to experience this knowing. Yeah. And you were prophetic in the gifts test. Yes. That was off the charts, right? Yep. And so what did you do with that information? Well, my parents had come to visit me and I was talking to them about it a little bit. And the, the blessing I have is that my parents know the Lord. And so in Wyoming, there's not a lot of Christian bookstores, but in Oklahoma, in the, I call the rhinestone of the belt buckle of the Bible belt, <laughs> we got some Christian bookstores. And so we went to a Christian bookstore and my dad, I think he bought me 12 books and they were all books that he'd read and filtered. So they weren't like you mentioned earlier, like charismaniac. They were just really solid word based. You know, um, one of the books was Jack Deere, surprised by the power of the spirit, you know, just really mm-hmm. solid theological books. And so I read those and just poured over them. A lot of them now, it's funny, are out of print. But in that season, they were they were really new. And so I read that and that helped. But then there's no one, you know, it's like academics. You know, I, I have my doctorate and there's a lot about theory that's great to read and know, 
but you don't really know how it works until you apply it. And that takes mentorship and guidance. And I didn't have that. And now the Holy Spirit is a great teacher, but I'm also a broken, immature 21-year-old at the time. Mm. And so that led to some interesting things happening. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm pretty intense. And so when I get an idea in my head, uh, I'm going to go for it. And so I would be talking to somebody and just... I don't know. It was like, I just had this impression, like this inner feeling that I knew things, you know, Mm -hmm. one of them was someone that was in ministry that I was with that I felt suffering with pornography. And so I just called him out and that didn't go well because that's, that's not loving and kind, which we'll talk about that in a bit, but I didn't know what to do with what I saw. I just felt like all I would do is I would just, if I saw it, I'd say it. And sometimes that would be really encouraging to people, but I didn't know how to I didn't know how to communicate what I was feeling. I didn't know is like, is this from God or is this just like my intuition and Mm -hmm. what does prophecy really mean? And, and so that kind of started that process. So I started going to the Kansas city house of prayer back when the house of prayer was in like six single wide trailers, like bolted together. And my parents would drive down from Wyoming and we'd meet in Kansas city and they would spend all day there. And I would spend all night. I was, you know, college and really just great encounters with the Lord. And it kind of opened me up to a little bit of the practice of prophecy I got some of their recordings and some of their cassettes to listen to, and that helped. And then I left. I called it the Great Church Search of 2004. So about three, four years, I was struggling with what to do with this gift and kind of started looking uh, for a church. Ended up going to Bridgeway, where I'd heard a lot of people mentioning it. It was kind of interesting that even my old youth pastor's wife had said, hey, there's this church in Oklahoma you should try out. It's it's called like Edmund Community Church or Fellowship Church, you know, which was what Bridgeway was in its infancy. <laughs> I didn't find that church anywhere, but I find Bridgeway and find out later it's the same church. And so <laughs> joined Bridgeway in 2004 and felt that there was real freedom in the gifts, but also not into the point where it was out of balance, um, if that makes sense. It wasn't seeking a feeling or wild experiences. They're really after God's heart. Mm-hmm. And I got into that and was around some people who operated very maturely in the prophetic gifting. And so just being around them and talking and then started kind of having some mentorship and understanding it and having it validated, like you didn't take the spiritual gifts test wrong. The Lord has a gift for you, pointing me to Corinthians where it talks to eagerly pursue spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. I mean, that's like, that's a biblical command. And so I looked at that and went, oh, I'm not crazy. I mean, maybe a little, but (laughs) you know, I'm not like, (laughs) this is, this is a biblical thing. No one's ever taught me. What I came to realize for me was that I was always so scared of the Holy Spirit as a person because I can't control it. I can't control him. The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit speaking to us, and it's something that comes out of our hands and, and is, I think, is our Western society very logical, very scientific, which is totally God too. But in this, like, I can predict and control if I go to church on Sunday and I read the Bible because I get to choose whether I read the Word or not. I get to choose whether I hear a sermon or not. But if I start submitting to the Holy Spirit, I have to wonder, like, am I? is it just me? Is that really God? And so it's just this disequilibrium for me, to use a fancy word, but that just trying to find balance in how do I walk and listen to God? And how does that work with the Word of God? And then what is the point? Because when I was young in the prophetic, I didn't understand New Testament prophecy. I kind of thought of it as Old Testament prophecy, right? Which it's it's very different. New Testament prophecy is built for the building up of the saints, encouragement, exhortation. Well, how do I handle that when I know people are struggling with these sin issues? And so I had to learn like the different processes of what that would mean and, and kind of go into. Someone listening to this may have the sense of, you know, I know I've heard of this, I've actually experienced these kind of promptings before, but I didn't really have a framework for it. What would you instruct someone to consider if they're feeling that way right now or thinking that way? You mean like as they're processing, like how would I maybe walk in this or? Yeah. Is this really real is probably the first question. And secondly, if it is, how do I use this without looking like a fool? Well, I can't answer the last part there because, you know, one of the things I think John Wimber said is faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Yeah. And I, and I do want to say that last, this past Sunday at church, I had a, a few different words for people at church and I'd had a picture of a guy having a problem with like his vision or his head or something. And I really was afraid. <laughs> like I was like, I even put in my notes cause I write it down like risk. And I, and I had the beginning part of the word. And then I had this other part that I was like, Ooh, I'm up front with a microphone. 
on a live stream. <laughs> I'm going to risk it. And I did. He ended up having vertigo, like totally hit it. But I totally had like my faith was raising it like, oh, all right, Lord, you're so good. But yeah, no, every day. And it's that. But I would say, um, you know, we're called to love one another. If you start there. So when you sit down and pray, and I, and I want to say this before I start explaining it, the whole purpose for prophecy and the gifts is intimacy with the Father. It's not so that I can get up and show off or call out things that the Lord has shown me or some, you know, supernatural thing. That's great. That's extra stuff that's not the focus. The focus is intimacy with Jesus. You know, do you know the Father? And He draws you in because just think of it as if your best friend, you like to tell him secrets. You like to know things. Like the Lord wants to have that relationship with you where He shares deeply with you. You have to have a cup that's full before you can pour things out of it. That comes from spending time in the Word. That comes from spending quiet time with the Lord. Because a lot of times in our culture, we're in the competition of busyness. Who can win the busy competition? And we have to be doing something all the time. Just look at social media. You know, Mm. you have to do 55 different things every day. The Lord wants us to stop, be still, and know that I'm God. And so if to start that process is to get quiet and to just ask the Lord about different people. I would have a list on, I had uh, these closet doors that were mirrors and I would write names on it. And then I would just pray for them. I would just say, Lord, what do you have for Brian? Lord, what, what do you like? Oh, I, would you bless him? Would you bless what he's doing? Lord? And I just would pray. And then I would have these just like things that I would just bubble up. And it it's interesting because we discount a lot of our words from the Holy Spirit because we're not really sure what to do with it. And I would just start writing it down and I wouldn't share it. I would just write it down. And the Holy Spirit was so faithful to start showing me these things happening in people's lives. Mm. As I was praying for this, and I would feel led to like, you know, almost like, man, I feel like I'm supposed to pray for for this job thing to happen, or I'm supposed to pray for their, like, they seem really down, you know, depressed, or they're struggling with some loss. Or And I would pray, and I would see these things I'd been praying that I felt was from the Lord that I had no external to know about suddenly happening. And so then it came to sharing it. And when I learned to be safe was starting to share it almost after the fact. Mm -hmm. Hey, I have been praying for you. And I felt like God was maybe saying this to me. And I always try to approach it, I I would say, in a very naturally supernatural way. Thus saith the Lord, old King James, I don't, God doesn't speak to me like that. Um, he, He talks to me normally. And I think sometimes we make it too charismatic or we put a little too much Christianese, if you will, into like, we just kind of try to use the lingo that we know and yeah. it just talk normally. You know, I'll be in a store with my wife and, you know, she'll say, do you have something for her? I'm feeling something for some woman in the aisle that we don't know. <laughs> and we walk up and just like, how are you? And just kind of talk and then say, hey, well, not to be awkward or anything, but in Target, you know, in the aisle, but like, we we love Jesus, and sometimes we feel like He shares things with people, and we just wanted to share this with you. And and I would say that nine times out of ten, it leads to us praying for them and them receiving it and mm-hmm. feeling really blessed. There's the time that some people are like, yeah, no, I'm good, thanks. But we always ask, is it okay if I share? Yeah, We don't ever force it. It's that intimacy. It's that love one another. It's that think of the best for one another. And so I would say it's safe to practice it in small groups. You have a best friend, close people, maybe even it's a family member. And you just say, hey, here's what I'm processing. I'm trying to understand this whole prophecy gift. Can I can I like bounce things off you and tell me what you think? And like, can I pray for you and see? It's those safe inner circles redevelop. You know, I wouldn't take someone who may be exploring the prophetic and go, hey, here's a microphone. Why don't you walk up on stage? Like that's that comes from a level of practice and maturity and hearing the Lord. And it's not meant for that. Like that's biblical to do that. But also the idea is that we're building one another up, just like you would pray or speak an exhortation to a, a dear friend or or another believer. The theme that's running through what you're sharing is so practical with respect to you have to grow just like in anything. You didn't become a PhD overnight. No, definitely not. You certainly don't get to a place where you can share things like you just mentioned, the gentleman who actually had vertigo and you felt like there was something going on with him. That doesn't happen overnight. And I think it's just really important to let people recognize this just takes time with the Lord and asking about it. Yeah. And then being willing, as you said, to R-I-S-K. We talk about practicing the gifts and doing that, you know, 
and I can't think of the scriptural reference exactly, but the word in there, I think it's in Ephesians, I want to say, but it, it's actually like gymnasium. It's where we get the word gymnasium, like to practice. And we walk those things out. I have my doctorate and that took years of, of study and devotion and time. And then that was the theory side. And then becoming a, an administrator, you know, in the field of education, moving up to the, the level that I am is totally based on failure and growth and learning. And I, I also feel very much that what the Lord does in the physical is often rep- represents what goes on in the spiritual. You know, so as I'm growing and maturing in my career and my life, and I became a father, and I became, you know, like for me, an assistant principal and a principal and, you know, assistant superintendent, all these different roles I've played. As I've done that, I feel like my maturity with the Lord has continued to go. Mm-hmm. As the more responsibility I get, the more I feel like the Lord is deepening my relationship with Him. For me, I see this parallel. What springs to mind? as one of your favorite target experiences, store experiences? Oh, there's been some fun ones. Let's share a couple. Yeah. So we, we've we had some where had a sense that somebody had been just forgotten by God. And, and the, honestly, that happens a lot. People think God doesn't know them. Hmm. And you just get to say, hey, I had this sense. And, and it can be, this happened a lot of times, it could be something as simple as, and, and I think that's, I want to say this too, 90% of prophecy is telling people that God loves them. He's for them. Like that is part of the exhortation. And so sometimes it's just, Hey, I just want to let you know, I have a sense from God that he really loves you and that you have been feeling like when we're telling a woman, you know, you've been feeling really isolated and alone and like your family hasn't even been connected. And you've just wondered, is it worth being alive? And I just want you to know that God today, like the Holy Spirit sent me here today to run into you to tell you that he loves you. And you just watch that like a total stranger Mm. coming up to them and saying, God loves you. And he told me, and then a little bit of word of knowledge of like things I wouldn't know. Like, how do you know my family isn't talking to me? Like, how do you know that's separate? Like you have no way to know me. (laughs) You know, you've been stalking me. And so it's interesting questions, but it's fun to say, no, the Holy Spirit loves you. Like he shows you those things. One that was really significant didn't, some of those stories at Target are those are risky stuff. Putting it in more of a context, maybe of like people understand is it's also risky is at work. And that's where it gets real fun because I, you know, I work in an education and there are Christians and there are non-Christians in education. And I have employees that work for me, a large number. And so how do I walk that gift out? Last year had an employee that was, you know, just struggling and had got together. We were talking about processes moving forward and got together with her direct supervisor and we were sharing And I just suddenly had this sense there was some struggles with just emotional stuff and things going on and not to get into too many specifics with it, but I shared that with her and just asked, are you feeling like this? I'm just sitting here right now and I'm just feeling that I'm a Christian and I, and I love the Lord and I really care about you or does this make sense? And just watching her just melt Mm -hmm. and I would have no reason to know this stuff, like none. And the guy in the office with me is a Christian, but does not go to a church that believes in the gifts. And he just kind of sat there with his eyes open, his jaw dropped, <laughs> just like, what is he doing? Dr. Eric, the assistant superintendent is saying this and just said, well, can I pray for you? Can, can we right now pray for you? Can I, is it okay if I put my hand on your shoulder and pray? And she just is weeping. Mm. Yes, please. So the other guy, her supervisor comes over and actually participates and we pray and ends up with her totally getting like going out and seeking like actual help and support and has had a lot of restoration wow. and healing from that. It, you know, like for her sharing things like she may not have been with us the next week yeah. and that God intervened was really, really powerful mm. um, for her. I think the thing I mentioned earlier about being naturally supernatural is, um, and I talked about even my faith as a kid watching my parents, you know, be Christians on Sunday or maybe Wednesday nights, because those are the holy days, right? You know, naturally supernatural means that God is God whether you're in a church building or I'm in my office, like he's still the Lord and he's still speaking all the time. I will say, you know, there are times where I phrase it so that I don't say, I have a prophetic word for you at work. Like that might be off-putting, but I'm like, Hey, I've just been praying for you. And I just wanted to share this. Like I've been praying for this and this. And they're like, wow, that's really Cordell, man. That's exactly what I needed prayer for, man. That thank you. And I I didn't know that, but there's in Oklahoma culture, it's okay to say, hey, I'm praying for you. You know, we always say thoughts and prayers, but like really to, to lean out and, and to do that is really fun to be able to do. What washes over me as you share that story with the individual in your office is the love of God, yes. the love of God. And yeah. that's the basis, the foundation for the use of these gifts. 
love. And someone that you are used of God to speak to a word of knowledge, something that only God could know, that you speak to them because he shows it to you, is so that they can undeniably know God loves them and God is for them. And I just think that's so encouraging and it's so needed, particularly now. Would you not agree? Oh, yeah. We have so much we call fake news or, you know, we get our identity from TikTok or Instagram and it becomes where that's a false gospel. That's a, a secular gospel where you're going to get your satisfaction from a false identity online, you know, where everything has to be perfect, where we're, we're not perfect. I'd be the first to claim to you, not perfect. But the God that spoke to Moses through a burning bush wants to sit with you in your living room and and he wants to speak to you and commune with you and love you. And not only that, he wants to work through you, which he doesn't have to, but he wants to, to love others. Like the blessing I get when people come up to me and just say, oh, like Cordell, you have no idea how much that meant that God did that. And and I'm like, praise the Lord. Like, that's awesome. You know, that that's the thing. And I, I, I do have this sense right now. I just want to share that you mentioned practically things to do. I would say for me, nature growing up in Wyoming, you know, the mountains. And I always look to the Psalms because David talks about the Psalms. God is like a mighty fortress or a big rock and a mountain. And, yeah. you, you know, those are all metaphors for what God's doing, but he speaks to you. I remember during the pandemic, we spent lots of time outside because we couldn't be anywhere else. And watching nature and just asking the Lord, like, you got to ask him, like, what are you saying right now, God? Yeah. You know, instead of talking at him, sit and listen. And we struggle as Americans, especially to sit and listen. We just want to wait for our turn to talk or fill the space. Silence is awkward. But if you sat just quiet, I would challenge people that listen to this, sit quiet for five minutes silent and ask God, what do you want to say to me? And then any impression, picture, feeling, write it down when you're done. See, he'll speak. And in saying that, like, that's how you start. That's how we eagerly pursue those gifts to where it leads to the place. And then this is my heart. I want to see the gift of prophecy expand and grow, not because it puts me on a pedestal at all, but because, you know, in First Corinthians, it talks about when people prophesy and unbelievers are there, people that don't know the Lord, they hear, wow, God is truly among you. And they then in turn fall on their knees and repent. So they see the power of God and they come to know Jesus because of the gift of prophecy. Like it's biblical. And I think that's what I want to see when we're giving words, when, when I'm sharing something at work and I watch people saved because they're like, Oh, God is with you. I want that God. You know, that's the power that comes from prophecy because we're all trying to share our faith and find ways to love people. And what a supernatural way that's, you know, it's truly amazing that you can't attribute to anything but the Lord. You know, there's no way I would know these things. What would be one of the greatest pieces of advice, aside from what you just mentioned, being outside, spending some time quietly, seeking the Lord, that you would share as we finish up here? I would say, number one, be plugged into a local church and be known. You know, no, being known in the Lord, being known is a huge thing to do that. And then I would say spending time in the Word and reading, they're really digging into that truth is so important. Because when you fill yourself up with the Word of God, you're filling yourself up with the love of God. And so what comes out is the love of God and doesn't come out your perceptions or thoughts, but just the Holy Spirit flowing through you. Mm. And I, I just think it's a the whole point, as I said earlier, it's not about the gift of prophecy in general in terms of, for me, of a prophetic word to someone. It's about intimacy with Jesus. Like as I'm giving words, the whole time I'm having a conversation with the Holy Spirit. Lord, why this person? Why now? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. I'm in Target. You know, like yeah. these things that come in, like we're at the state fair, we're trick-or-treating. And my wife on will be walking and go, hey, Cordell, look at, I just get back with the kids. Here's this couple and we, we're going to pray for them. And I had this sense and I'm I'm just like, all right, we're let's do what we're doing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> And I, I think that's the thing is, is, when you walk in this gift and you start really seeking it, which is like I mentioned in Corinthians, is a biblical thing to do, eagerly desire. If you're asking the Lord and you're saying, Lord, what are you saying to me? He'll speak. The other thing I do want to say is to kind of talk about the ultra charismatic or the things I would say that kind of veer off the script of, of the word in terms of the operation and practice of this gift 
is God is not always going to give me a prophetic word. I'm not always going to be there. There was a time I was in India on a mission trip, and the pastor that was there said, oh, you know, Cordell's here from America, and he has a word for you. And I see 200 eyes turn and look at me. <laughs> and I'm like, ah! And I was like, oh, geez. And talk about pressure. And I didn't have prophetic words for 200 people. I stood in line with them for two hours, and I sometimes I just spoke the love of God over them, like, God loves you, and he blesses you, and I'll just pray for them. Mm-hmm. Some people I had words for, mm-hmm. but I didn't force it. And if I didn't, I didn't. I don't try to make it. I don't think there's a as much a thing like I can tell God when to tell me things. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Yeah, that shifts into performance. Yes. And yeah. I don't and I don't want that. I, I want God glorified, not Cordell at all at all. You know, it's it's really about Jesus. It's about people knowing him and knowing how much he loves them. The other thing too, uh, the gift of prophecy is not about publicly revealing your sin either. I sense, I mentioned earlier when I told my story about, you know, one of the people I was in ministry with young and in college and calling them out on their struggles with pornography. That's not a loving thing. You know, Mm. that's, did I know that? Was it true? Yes. Was that the way to do that? No. And so if you're sensing those things, take it to a mature person, take it to an elder at your church, take it to a close friend, ask, Hey, I'm feeling this. This is weird. I do that now. Mm. And I lead the prophetic ministry at our church and, and do lots of stuff, you know, around the, the state. And I still ask, I still go, Hey, bounce this off. This is, are you feeling this? And I, cause I don't want to assume that I have those things. So those are things where people get wounded in the gift. And I think that people are like, Oh, prophecy, good luck. You know, what do you think is one of the best resources for learning more about this gift? I mentioned Jack Deere earlier. He has some great books that I think are really biblically founded and really good about understanding it. Sam Storms has some books on the spiritual gifts that are really good. They're they're biblically based, you mm-hmm. know, word and spirit together. And those would be really good places to start. You know, there's lots of videos of Sam and Jack speaking and teaching and practicing, the, you know, for Jack Deer specifically, practicing the gifts. And so it's a good place to watch and see that. And it's encouraging to do that because it stirs your faith. What was it Thomas that said, Lord, help me with my unbelief, you know, yeah. always. So it's that seeing those things, seeing that happen, you know, when I am able to share a word from the front on Sunday mornings, it's not so that I can call somebody out or embarrass them, but it's because not only will that person be encouraged, but in the room, people have their faith encouraged. Like, oh, the Lord is speaking today. You know, like it's been a rough week and I came and, and I saw God speak. And I think that's a, an important thing too. That I would say those would be really safe places to start that are going to be very biblical grounded and and have that. And then you kind of dig into their world. You can find connections with them in lots of different different areas. Great. I'll put those in the show notes. Thanks. As we finish up, I'd love to have you pray for our listeners, please. Absolutely. So, Father, I just pray for those that are listening right now that you would stir up a desire to know you deeper. Lord, that intimacy with you would become more important than the air that they breathe. And Lord, I pray that that this gift, Lord, would be found to be true. You are true, God, and that there would be this experience and this outpouring of, of the prophetic in our churches in a way that is biblical and loving, and Lord, that is centered around submission to a local church. And Lord, I just ask that you would raise the faith of all of us, Lord, that we would we would lean into you when it doesn't make sense to do so because you're so good. And Lord, that you would just cause us to be built up and encouraged and want to be more bold because you are so bold to love us, Lord, when we don't deserve to be loved. So Father, mm-hmm. would you just pour that out? I just bless this podcast and just ask, Lord, that your love for others and the faith that it brings will continue to just multiply out, Lord, and encourage the body of believers. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Cordell. Loved the conversation. It was great. Thanks, Brian. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. Please make sure you subscribe to the show and share this with someone you believe would be encouraged and motivated by these stories. Until next time, I'm Brian Robinson reminding you that the greatest decision you could ever make is to ask Jesus Christ to become the Lord of your life. If you haven't done that, read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Thanks again for listening.